Kala 11, that thou art a compendium. Question, what is the term tat, that? In Sage Uddalaka's exposition given to his son Shvetketu, I like to give you this story. This is in the listed in uh, the Samaveda that there was a great master uh, called Uddalak. And when the time came, he asked his uh, son to join a Gurukula. So after finishing his studies in the Gurukula, the son came back after a good 20 years. And then the father asked his son that, have you known that after which nothing else is left to be known? Shwet Ketu said, well, I have uh, read about astrology and Rig Veda and Yajur Veda and Samveda and Atharva Veda. I have read all about uh, Ayurveda. The, but I haven't known such a thing that after knowing that, everything gets to be known. Uh, Guru, the father said, then your studies are not complete. You are not yet a Brahmin. Shwet Ketu said, you are Brahmin, you are my father, I am born to you, so obviously I am a Brahmin. Uddalaka said that, no, until you attain Brahma, you cannot be called a Brahmin. You are not a Brahmin. Now, this example of Samved should be, I believe, um, advertised and exhibited on all platforms. See, this Samaveda, so part Chandogya Upanishad, is a classic example that our country never believed in. Our forefathers, our sages, our rishis, and their, the lineage never believed that you become a Brahmin just because you have been born in a Brahmin family. But by the time the, the Dwapar came, the Sri Krishna time, things were already getting bad. And uh, again, the classic example is Karana, who was a warrior, but he was not being given education uh, of uh, the archery because he was not a prince and he was not uh, from the warrior clan. And now it is a Kali Yuga, so things are much more bad. But still I believe that if somebody will go back to Vedas, they will find that the best society uh, idea is right there. And so Uddalak uh, then asked his son to go back and Shwet Ketu went. Again, I approached his guru that my, my father has asked me a question, why haven't you taught me that? The, the guru said that for this, your father is the most correct person. I cannot give you this. Now see the beauty and the humbleness of his guru. I, can, I cannot teach you this. For this, it is better you go back to your father, but not like a son, but like a disciple. So the tradition was holding the uh, wood sticks, samidha, because the, the sages would do the agni hotra, the fire ceremony, morning and evening. So that dried wood was considered to be a symbol of surrender. So Shwet Ketu, uh, with the samidha in his hand, went back to his father, offered him the Samhita, did his Dandvat Pranam, you know, the full staff prostrations. And then he asked for the, that, please accept me as your disciple and give me that teaching of Brahm. After knowing that, everything will be known. So when the Uddalak spoke to his son, and that's, that's the teaching what he gave, right?
So now, now we go into those. In Sage Uddalak's exposition given to his son Shweta Ketu, in the sixth chapter of Chandogya Upanishad, on the Mahavakya, the great aphorism, Tat Tvam Asi, this is the teaching what he gave, Tat Tvam Asi. The first word of this statement is Tat, that, what is the term Tvam? In the Mahavakya Tattvam Asi, the second word is Tvam, Thou, meaning you. What is the meaning of the terms of Vachyarth and the Lakshyarth? The association of a Shabda with its Artha meaning is known as the Shabda Vritti. Shabda Vritti. Vritti is again of two types. One is Shakti Vritti and Lakshana Vritti. Shakti Vritti is the direct association of a word with the power to fathom. Its literal meaning is called Shakti Vritti. Hmm. And Lakshana Vritti, by knowing the literal meaning through Shakti Vritti, fathoming the con contextual association of the word with its implied meaning is called Lakshana Vritti. So in Lakshana, yes, the base of the Shakti Vritti is there. The literal meaning of that word is there. But then we move further and then contextual, in context to that word, there is an association of this word to a thing. What is implied? When that implication is understood, that is called Lakshana Vritti. In the above, the meaning known through Shakti Vritti is called Vachyartha of the Shabda. It is also known as Shakyartha and Mukya Artha. The meaning known through Lakshana Vritti is called Lakshya Artha. So Lakshana Vritti and Shakti Vritti. The Shakti Vritti will define the word as literally as it is. And it has a direct association. You don't need to think too much. Like say, what's, which is the flask? This is the flask. You see it and you know it. Okay. Now the association is there. You know already the object and that object was given the name. This is the name. So without a name, there is no object. Or if you see an object, you'll ask, what is it? Very natural. So when the answer comes in, that is called the Shakti Vritti. Now, whatever you have heard and understood is stored in your memory. Hence, whenever you see that object again, the memory power comes back and gives you that literal meaning, the Shakti Vritti. So Shakti also, as you know, power, the power of the Vritti, the power of the mind to relate with a word and directly have a contextual association with that object, but there is some implication also, then this very Shakti Vritti converts into Lakshana Vritti. What are the types of Lakshana Vritti? Lakshana Vritti is of three types, Jahat, Ajahat and Bhag, Tyag. How to comprehend the three types of Lakshana with exemplification? Disregarding a word's literal meaning and considering only its contextual reference or implied meaning is its Jahat Lakshana. For example, a man asked someone, where is the cow shed located? The fellow replied, the cow shed is in the Ganges. Here, the Vachyarth, the literal meaning of the word Ganges, flowing stream of Devanadi, the holy river. However, it is not possible for a cow shed to literally exist in the flow of the Ganges. Hence, the literal meaning is disregarded and is implied that on the banks of the Ganges, on the river. Now, it's, um, in Hindi language, it's very commonly used phrases. Like if somebody say, 
I asked, uh, for example, me, uh, long ago, where do you live? And, and I'll say, I can say, uh, uh, Amritsar, Golden Temple. Now, because I know Golden Temple is famous, then comes Amritsar is famous. So the moment I say Amritsar, what flashes in their head? Golden Temple. So where do you live? I said, Golden Temple. And they got it. Okay, you live there. And then he said, then you must be eating prasad every day. <laughs> well, I don't live in the temple. I live in the city where this temple is. When the implied or the contextual meaning is imbibed without discarding the vachyarth, that is called a jahat. For example, a man says red runs. Huh? Oh, red bull. <laughs> <laughs> red runs. <laughs> hey? uh, here the literal meaning is in an absurdity. Thus, the extended implied meaning is deduced, a red-colored horse is running. In this manner, the literal meaning of the word red is not discarded, rather its contextual reference to a horse is inferred as well. Right? In Jahat, we are leaving, but in Ajahat, we are not leaving, but we are taking that red color as given in the example, and then putting it on some horse, you know, or a brown oh, um, UP, Punjab, you know, may, like if a child is born with little dark skin, will be named Kala, black. So if the boy is running, they say Kala is running. If somebody is born very fair, will be named Gora. Gora means white. So if, so if uh, the Gora, Gora is running. So we, now the white color cannot run. That color must be on somebody which is running. But in, in general terms, these, these things are... I always remember this when I say Gora Kala, I always remember in Tarantaran I met a boy. He was like a help in a shop. And his color was more black than the girdle. And this old sweat on his forehead and that too is shining. So that, that shining black colored boy. And I just asked, what's your name? He said, Gora. <laughs> <laughs> so how come? Now the mother, out of love, you know, affections for her, the son is uh, Gora. <laughs> so now, the, when the contradictory part of the Vachyarth is discarded, is discarded and only the contextual non-contrary meaning is retained, that is called Bhag Tyag Lakshana. If person doesn't know, you know, how to read it, Bhaga, Tyaga, <laughs> Bhaga, Tyaga, Lakshana. <laughs> like somebody in uh, Florida uh, said that we, uh, yeah, yoga studio is also teaching Patanjali. And said, okay, well, what did you, what did you read there? Chitti Vritti Nirutha. What? Chitti Vritti. So they, they are just pronouncing it as it has been written. Well. So, bhaga tyaga lakshana. It's bhaga. See, when the when there is this uh, sign on the on the alphabet, this means that you uh, pronounce it little longer. So the a becomes a a is going to take a. So the a with that uh, sign. Sign is called what? A bar. A bar. You can say. So if it comes with the the a with the bar on it becomes a. So it becomes Bhaga. But we are not saying Bhaga because the last A doesn't has any bar. So it becomes a smaller sound. So it is Bhaga Tyaga. Again, there is a bar on the A. 
Hence it is Tyag. Lakshana. The A has again a bar which means you hold it and the A becomes the A. For example, when man seen in some place at some point in time, <laughs> is seen again in some other place at some other point in time. The observer remarks that man seen in that place at that time has come to this place at this time. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that point and that <coughs> time and that place so that some other time some other place and some other time like you saw somebody in Delhi and then you saw that same person in ashram you say, oh this is the same person whom I saw in Delhi is now here well, some, some. Here, and if one considers the literal meaning, there is a contradiction between that and this. Hence, the literal meaning of the words is ignored. And it is inferred that the man seen then and now is the same person. In this way, non-contradictory inference is made. Question? In the... Three types of lakshana are described, which one can be possibly applied to the said Mahavakya. Where jahat lakshana is used, the literal meaning is completely dropped. If jahat lakshana is applied to Mahavakya, then the inherent presence of Brahma Chaitanya and Sakshi Chaitanya in the words Tat and Tvam will also be discarded. That is, and Tvam is, da. And now change it into, like this. If I say you, then you understand as I. I ask how are you, and you say I am good, or I am bad, whatever. So Guru is saying Dao, Tvam, but for the listener it becomes I. So when I say Tat, then surely it is the Brahma Shaitanya. When I say Tvam, for your understanding it should be I. So in Brahma Chaitanya and Sakshi Chaitanya, Brahma and Sakshi Chaitanya too. So Tat and Tvam. So if we discard Tat and Tvam, what is left? Who wants to meet who? Nobody. Moreover, the statement will be taken as a reference to the Asat, Jad, Dukha, Prapancha. Or along with the microcosmic and ma macrocosmic worldly impositions, the Chaitanya will also be discarded and only the remaining emptiness will be considered. So this is what? This becomes uh, Baudha Dharma then. Everything has been discarded. This will render it meaningless and Purushartha will not be fulfilled. Thus, Jahat Lakshana cannot be applied to the Mahavakya. And in a Jahat Lakshana, the literal meaning is not discarded, but the extended contextual reference is also considered. If Ajahat Lakshana is applied to the Mahavakya, then the literal meaning of both words Tat and Tvam are retained as it is. In addition, their extended meaning, wise emptiness, will also have to be considered. This means that the contradiction to their unity will persist. You know, if we deduce Tat and Tvam both, then what is left? Asat, Jad, Dukha, Rup, Sansar and Parapanch. And which is an illusion. So we can't take Jahat and we also cannot take a Jahat because in a Jahat, what was happening was that if we retain the Tatvam and the extended meaning of the emptiness is taken, like the red is running, it was a red horse is running. 
So we left the horse and kept the red and then implied that red horse is running. So over here, if we just take the extended meaning, then that is coming just illusion or emptiness. It's a, so with then again, there aren't any two left who have some common factor with which we can establish the unity in between the Sakshi Chaitanya and the Brahma Chaitanya. Thus, application of this Lakshana will not fulfill the objective. Therefore, a Jahat Lakshana cannot be used for Mahavakya. In Bhag Tyag Lakshana, the contra contradictory part in the meaning is dropped and the non contrary context is retained. If Bhag Tyag Lakshana is applied to the Mahavakya, then in the literal meanings of the word tat tvam, the contradictory parts of the maya avidya are discarded and the non-opposing and unassociated part that is why is the chaitanya is retained. In this way, their unity is established and this leads to the fulfillment of Purushartha, the ultimate objective of human life. Thus only Bhag, Tyag, Lakshana is applicable to the Mahavakya. Can somebody tell me, uh, how will you explain the Sakshi Chaitanya? Who or what or what attributes are of the Sakshi Chaitanya? When we say Tvam, then in Tvam, what does that mean? How is this twum formed? Ipsa. Twum, twum, kaise bana? Jisko ap twum kaite usme kya hai? Hmm. And when we say Ishwar? If we say that, what what would be the definition of that? Reflection of Brahma in the Maya. And Tvam will be? So what are the contradictory over here? Avidya. Avidya and Maya. And what is the, the common factor in both? Chaitanya. Chaitanya. So the Sakshi Chaitanya and the Brahma Chaitanya is one. Avidya and Maya, we leave the Avidya and we leave the Maya. So know this that when I say you are Brahm, I am not saying Jeeva is Brahm because Jeeva is already an illusion. If you see this, this I as a Jeev, then definitely you are not Brahm. Point is, where are you standing? Where are you standing? In body, in mind, you are definitely not Brahm. Because that contradictory part, if it is not discarded, the Bhagatyag Lakshana Vritti has to be applied. The contradictory has to be removed away. Now, this cannot be understood if you have not done the rest of the work which we have explained in the 10 chapters earlier. So, if your intellect is still a Dumbo, body obsessed, with body consciousness, then actually this book is not for you at all. I know your ambitiousness says, when everybody is reading, why can't I also read? Okay, now let me say it like that. Tomorrow only those walk in, those who think that they are prepared and they have the eligibility.
because we are talking about something but your ma- you your sense of me if it's still in the body and mind still in that illusionary i actually this whole book is useless for you then absolutely useless because it's like it's like again alice in the wonderland you haven't seen alice and you don't know what wonderland she went in but when you read the story okay alice went in the wonderland where the tables are talking and and the and the small ant is of elephant size and the elephant is of the ant size and and the flowers are growing upside down and the stars are on the ground you know all that weirdo things which they alice saw and this girl was just bamboozled by seeing all this funny and strange and unique things around her and she keeps on pinching herself if it is a dream why isn't it ending is it a dream or not and she keeps on pinching herself and oh it's not going away so this whole vedanta is just like an alice in wonderland for you then it's not that you just uh, understood the words which are being written here and i am i am speaking and explaining to you that what it means but point is where, where are you standing where are you standing so now the i have i have kind of um, that's the what you call that is a hornet nest and that's a very big trouble for me you know the when i am being bombarded with so much of tamoguna of your minds and so much of rajogunas of your mind and your actions which you do oh, it's very difficult for me then you know to it's just i really then my reflex action is to just stop right away not even for a second and i want to talk on to that and that's my very big issue uh, if i do it to the uneligible actually i'm guilty i'm guilty of a crime actually i am shastra says that bhagavad gita shri krishna ends his whole dialogue by saying this to arjuna that do not speak this to uneligible do not let them know about what i have spoken to you he is kind of taking promise from arjuna he will never speak this to an uneligible person and this is one of the reason that our shastras were never written because if it is written any person can buy it take it borrow it steal it and read it the guru would only speak when the guru would see that the disciple is ready for it it might take 12 years it might take 20 years of doing yoga asana and pranayam and seva and and the general conduct of that person what is the general conduct of that person how violent or how skeptical how doubtful how dirty the mind is and if with that very mind this is this is all red and maybe the, you know you can you're not a fool so you, so you can grab what i'm speaking and making you understand with all the efforts but will of will this be of any use then you will have to say this but i the the blunt words are this that there are certain people when i see them i want to teach them and i feel like they are so worthy of it but sometimes some faces and some individuals are not at all it will take long time for them to come to that point where i really feel like okay now they are ready
this is not a general information which you can just hold in your brains and be proud. Oh, we have done Vichar Chandrodaya. It's not like that. Like the water doesn't vaporize until it comes to 100 degree of temperature. Similarly, until the mind is that pure, that translucent, that much filled with sattva guna, this gyan isn't going to um, vaporize your darkness, your agyana will still stay there. It won't go away. And then you would wonder, what change happened in me? Nothing. Did I get permanent? No. Am I feeling I am flying? No. Then this means it was just a sham what they said. That you will get permanent when you will know Brahm. And here I have now known I am Brahm but I am not feeling any permanent. If your, if your head is still confused with the fog of questions and this cloudiness is still there, then what has cleared? Now is that some incompetence on my part? Because I am speaking so I can easily say no. No, there is no incompetence on my part. Is there incompetence in this Vicharchandrudaya book? It's not. It's a great book. It's a gem of uh, Vedanta in uh, regional language. Then where is the incompetence? Pay attention to that part. Okay, the question. We'll take one more. What is the Vachyartha and the Lakshyartha of the word Tat? Unmanifested Maya is the realm of Ishvara. Creation, preservation and destruction are the three Kala phases of time of Ishvara. Sattva Guna, Rajoguna and Tamoguna are the three Vastu, the material construct of Ishvara. They are the building blocks required for the creation of the material world. Virat, Hiranyagarbh and Avyakrita, these are the three bodies of Ishvara. Vaishvanara, Sutratma and Antaryami, these are the three knowers of the I-ness that identifies with the, these three states of Ishvara. I am one, may I manifest as multiple beings. This very desire became the originating point leading to the inception of multiple jivas. From above singularity to the plurality of the manifested world, this is the remit of Ishvara. Eight characteristics of Ishvara, all powerful, all knowing, all pervasive, singular, independent, supremely adept, parokshpana, imperceptible to the senses, with the upadhi of maya, all the above including maya with the reflected chidabhasa in it and the adhishthan brahma, these together are known as Ishvara. This is the vachya earth of the term tat. On discarding the above mentioned parts along with the Maya and Chidavhasa, what remains is the Adishthan of Virat, Hiranyagarb, Abhya, Krita, that is the witnessing pure Brahma, which is Lakshyarth of the term Tat. Virat, Hiranyagarb, Abhya, Krita. These are the names of the Ishvara in the three stages of Ishvara's waking, dreaming and the deep sleep of Ishvara. This is too much to absorb. 
but you will have to go through again and again and again to actually get the gist of it. There is one term which came in this was parokshpana that is imperceptible to senses. So from on the basis of this one attribute of Ishwara, we can say Ishwara will never be seen in a human form. And wherever the human form is, is not of Ishwara. Ishwar is the one who is, because of the upadhi of Maya, now Maya in itself means illusion. So if somebody says, I want to decode Ishwara with this small intellect, it will never happen. Because Ishwara is paroksh, hence Ishwar will be never perceptible through your senses or your mind. Then, then how come all these things have been told? Now this is, let's say like, like this, that in the jivas, there are certain jivas who are born with those attributes. You can say like kind of Ishwara attributes in them or that. Like a rose is a born rose. Rose doesn't do anything to become a rose. In jivas also there are, there were certain individuals who were born in the human form, but they were those who were like kind of all knowing. They knew about everything. They were all powerful. See, in, in our Puranas they are talking about the, the quantification of earth, water, fire, and all. How did they come to know? Our astronomy, the Jyotish Shastra, is talking about the movement of the planets, the axis of the planet, the gravity rotations calculations of our earth, the northern poles calculations are there. And it is going into not just the at the level of the seconds, it's also going into the microseconds. How, how did the Rishi Bhrigu understand all this? There were no telescopes, so how did he come to know that there is a ring around the Saturn? How did he know what is the constituent of Jupiter and how the energies of the Jupiter or Saturn or Moon will have this particular effect on the body? So not only they understood the five elements, they also understood the energetics of these elements and the heavenly bodies which got created by these elements. Is there any, is there any, um, you know, limit to their knowing? If we see the Ayurveda, then um, Ayurveda, for example, the Ashtanga Hridayam is talking about the properties of water and there are at least 20 types of water which have been talked about, right from the rain water to cloud water to dew drop to rivers to waterfalls, to oceans, to water in the wells and water in the different geographical regions. What is the property of the water? Same goes for the grains and the pulses and the vegetables and the herbs and about the different seasons, the six seasons which we have in Bharat. And, and they are talking about so detailed and some of those herbs are today extinct. We can't even find those. And, and they, are, they are telling us all about that. How did they know all that? So that's why in the jivas, there are certain who have these Ishwariyata. You know, it's like Ishwar. Like, they are like Ishwar. And that's why we consider Sri Krishna as the incarnation of the Ishwara. When we say Ishwara, then, then there is again a name form behind that. That is a Vishnu. 
is the incarnation of Vishnu. So all powerful, independent, supremely adept, has upadhi of Maya. But Krishna is Pratyaksha, he is not Paroksha. So is Ram, so is Shiva, so is Parvati. If you go into Shiv Purana, then Shankar and Parvati, now and then, they are going into Tapasya. They are, they are saying, they are leaving everything and they say, okay, now I am going into Tapasya. And when they go into Tapasya, then they, nobody knows when they will come out of that Samadhi. How many Kalpas they will stay in that Samadhi. How is it possible? The body has very small duration to live and, and they are doing sadhana for Kalpas. This means that they knew something more than what you, the hum, human beings still don't know. That they had an understanding of kind of holding the aging of the body in certain way that they could use that same body for many, many kalpas. Or should I say they knew the science of kaya kalpa. And we have many examples in our Puranas where the, the, the Rishi, Rishi Chavan for example, um, he, his body was getting old and frail and, and one day he sits down to think that how can I change this body and that is it is said that in meditation then he made this uh, equation of certain set of herbs and the procedure and in that procedure this this special uh, paste like thing was was uh, made and then he in there there's a huge there's a very large and extensive detail about how his hut was how his this was how his day and nights were and there was a discipline which he was following al along and then he ate that that paste, that prash which was made and then his body became young and vibrant back again and that paste or that prash is what you call chavan prash but you can now buy a chavan prash in a quintals and eat all that you might die with dysentery and diarrhea or maybe other complications and the youth won't come to you what went wrong? So it is not just the Chavan Prash the, that Rishi Chavan was doing something else. We changed his body from old to young back again. And then they could, they could uh, elongate their life for as long as they want. Hence the Shankar is always there. Krishna came, Krishna went back. The, but Vishnu is there. We say the, there, there are these Vishnu and and okay, this Vishnu and Krishna and and Brahma and all these three major deities of the Hindu uh, belief system says that Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. Now we have so many stories where Vishnu is is seen and then. And then Shankar is met and the, the devotees are getting the divine darshan and everything. But here the Shastra of Vedanta is saying that Ishwar is Paroks. This means all those forms which might have happened for a small or a long duration. When I say long, then it's kai kal, many, many kalpas in which they were, they were existing with those particular bodies. That same similar body, no change in that body. But still, Vedanta says, that which can be seen is not Ishwara. But might have the all the Ishwar attributes in it. Have the Ishwara attribute. Upadhi of Maya is there. Now what is Maya if that which doesn't exist but has the power to make itself feel is Maya. So Maya, Adishtan Brahm, 
uh, is when reflected in the Maya is called the Chida Vasa, that is what the Ishvara, and that is the Vachya Arth, meaning the literal meaning of the word Tat. So, tat Tvam Asi, that's the Mahavakya. So now we have done up till Tat.